This channel is part of the History Hit Network. On December 7th, 1941, Japan stunned the world with a surprise attack on the United States of America. Pearl Harbor and the Pacific Fleet were left burning. Then, one by one, Allied strongholds fell. Malaya, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the Philippines among them. The Allies faced defeats they had never imagined possible and scrambled to adapt to a war very different from the one raging in Europe. A war in the jungle. In the jungle, darkness envelops the soldier, illness incapacitates, and tension is ever-present. This is the story of the jungle wars that erupted across the globe in the 20th century. The people who fought for survival in the jungle, the soldiers who adapted their tactics to guerrilla fighting, and the civilians whose lives and homes were decimated by jungle war. In war, the jungle is a breeding ground for fear. Darkness and dense foliage hinder visibility and navigation. Unfamiliar noises assail the ears. Heat and humidity sap the energy and morale of a unit. And tropical illness can decimate it as effectively as enemy action. Before they even catch sight of their foe, a soldier must confront their fears and the innumerable challenges of the environment around them. The jungle is equally frightening for everybody. Mosquitoes don't care whether you're British or Japanese or Australian. They still bite you. It's still hot. It's still rainy. Things still rot. Things still go wrong. So the jungle itself is not on one side or the other. The jungle may be neutral, but for those who fight within it, it is far from benign. In uh, World War II in the Pacific, jungle warfare was really challenging. Everything was dangerous. It may have looked like the Garden of Eden and very beautiful, but one could be injured or poisoned by the snakes, by fleas, by ticks. The water was generally poisonous. A dysentery was a problem. All different kinds of problems were there. The story of jungle warfare in World War II is a story of adaptation. It is a story of how armies learn to fight in foreign and formidable environments. It is a story which begins with Japanese plans for expansion in the 1930s, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. で、これは1932年あたりから第一次世界大戦を世界大恐慌が始まります。そういうすなわち世界はモテる国、資源のある国とモタザル国。一番欲しかったのは東南アジアにもって、特にインドネシアですね。インドネシアの油田、石油を取
じゃあこれだけの広大な土地をどういう生態制で、えー、の支配していくかっていうことはまだ全然議論してないあのどういうスケジュールでこれを作っていくかということも全くできてないんですねただとにかくあの、えー、大きな日本が占領した地域をこういう形にした方がいいという夢があるだけで、まあ、そこでそれで終わってしまうわけですけども。History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world, from the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era right through to the Second World War. If you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code War Stories at checkout. Initially, Western nations were largely unconcerned with Japanese plans. British defensive preparations in the region centered on the flawed Fortress Singapore strategy. The British fleet would remain in Europe. Ships would be dispatched in defense of the Asia Pacific region when needed. The flaw in the plan was revealed when Britain was forced to fight in more than one theater. The United States had remained largely isolationist in the years following the First World War. As Japan's imperial ambitions grew in the 1930s, the U.S. took little action. But slowly, as Japan expanded her reach, the U.S. began to respond. They began directing support to China in her struggle against Japanese imperial ambitions. A loan promised to China in July 1937 was delivered in February 1939. In July, the U.S. announced it would end its commercial treaty with Japan, a tentative step toward economic sanctions. Japan's signature of the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy in September 1940 proved to be another harbinger of impending war. The pace towards the Pacific War quickened. In、uh, 1941, the United States was in the middle of the war. So, in 1941, the American government was in the middle of the war. So, in the middle of the war, the American government was in the middle of the war. So, 約1年半ぐらいだったんですそうしますと当時は日米関係が非常に緊迫しておりましたのでそれ,それからは日本は対米海戦に向けてこうこういろいろな手続きを踏んでいくということになったんです。The Allies made a triage decision. They would defeat Europe first before they turned their attention to the Pacific. President Roosevelt hoped economic and trade sanctions on Japan would prevent outright war. These hopes soon floundered. It sort of put the Americans and the Japanese on a, a collision course. Roosevelt wasn't naive, neither were his advisors. The Secretary of State, Cardinal Hall, warned against this policy. He said, You're going to force us into a war. But most of the cabinet regarded it as a policy of deterrence, that the Japanese wouldn't dare proceed because it was going to cost them too much. So, while the Allies maintained their focus on Europe, Japan planned to take the jungles of Southeast Asia in a sweeping movement. People from across the world were soon drawn into a brutal jungle war. あの日本はですね東南アジアに侵攻して、えー、そしてあの日本に必要な軍事物資を獲得しようということが一つの目的、えーまあ、戦の海戦の目的がありましたでもう一つは、えー、中国の介石に対する炎症ルートを叩くという、えー、この目的のためにですね、まあ、戦争を、えー、起こしたわけですが
た戦争を起こすと必ずアメリカが介入してくるそうアメリカは非常に強大な国ですからアメリカが出てくると、えー、戦争を目的を達することが非常に難しくなると。On the 7th of December 1941, Japan launched a series of devastating attacks. The Allies were profoundly unprepared for the Blitzkrieg unleashed. The Japanese had very effectively concealed the extent of their capabilities,、uh, particularly in that realm of air power, naval air power. And so it came as a very nasty surprise to the Americans, to the British, to the Allies. The story of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor is a well known moment in history, marking a flashpoint in the war. The moment the war in Asia and the Pacific fused with the broader global conflict. Pearl Harbor, on the island of Oahu in Hawaii, played host to the U.S. Pacific Fleet, making it a significant strategic target. So, the American country. しハワイのパールハーバーにいるときにそこに奇襲攻撃をかけて全滅させれば、まあ、少なくても半年や1年はアメリカはその日本および東南アジアのところに来ることができない。The first wave of Japanese planes swept into the skies above Pearl Harbor a little before 8 a.m. Hawaii time. On Sunday, the 7th of December. This first sweep of attacks proved effective. Close to 200 Japanese fighter, bomber, and torpedo planes rained destruction from above. At Wheeler Field, little more than 40 of more than 120 U.S. aircraft on the ground survived the onslaught. Simultaneously, Japanese aircraft created havoc among the ships in the harbor. Only partially manned on a Sunday morning, they were vulnerable. All eight of the U.S. battleships in harbor were hit. Four sunk. The USS Arizona and Oklahoma were beyond repair. It was a crippling blow to the United States naval force. But there was a fatal flaw in the Japanese attacks. あの日本の計画では2回パールハーバーを叩く計画だったわけですが1回の計画だけで帰ってきてしまいましたそのためにパールハーバーに対する攻撃は少し中途半端になりましただからもう1回叩いておけばアメリカは1年ぐらい立ち直れなかったんじゃないかというまあそういうように言われるわけですね The Hawaiian oil fields also remained intact. For all the destruction of ships and aircraft, Japan failed to destroy the key thing which would have truly delayed a U.S. counterattack. And I think the Pearl Harbor attack did come as a total shock、uh, to both the president, to his、uh, naval and, and army chiefs of staff, and to the American people. Rather than serving as a deterrent, Pearl Harbor galvanized U.S. support for the war. On December 8th, Congress declared war on Japan. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. By naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. While Pearl Harbor burned, Japan wreaked havoc to the west. Malaya and Singapore were key targets. Malaya was resource rich, and it was a gateway to Singapore. As the key strategic base for the British in Asia, Singapore 
needed to be neutralized. In the early morning of December 8, 1941, Japanese aircraft attacked British airfields in Malaya and Singapore. The initial aerial offensive was immensely effective. Very quickly, they were able to win supremacy in the skies above all of those places. In addition, they had command of the sea and were able to land their amphibious forces essentially wherever they wanted along the long coastlines of these islands in the Pacific. And once they were ashore, they had the seaborne supply lines to allow those forces to advance very quickly. The British command had some warning of the attack. Reconnaissance planes had spotted the fleet, but they hesitated, and the Japanese took the momentum. The situation on the sea was no better. The ships the Royal Navy could spare for the fight HMS Repulse and Prince of Wales were sunk on the 10th of December by Japanese aircraft based in Saigon. These events did not bode well for troops on the ground. This left British and Imperial forces completely vulnerable, both to the sky and to possible further Japanese invasions along the coast. Soon after the air attack, troops poured into Singora and Patani in Thailand and Kota Baru in Malaya. The attack on Malaya was rapid. Momentum was key. Uh, ま、Facing them were an array of British, Australian, Indian, and Malay troops. They were not well equipped. The idea that the Japanese won in Malaya because of superior jungle training was at best only partially true. There were significant weaknesses in the British Imperial defense. The two most serious were the lack of air cover and the lack of ships to cover the coast. Additionally, British defense did not account for the challenges of jungle warfare. In many ways, the British Indian Army in Malaya was trained for the wrong sort of war. Being motorized and designed to cross open areas, it was quickly in trouble on narrow jungle tracks. The men were just not trained for the sort of fighting that they quickly came up against. Before they encountered Japanese troops, the Allies had assumed their own superiority. The initial fight on the ground rapidly shifted this view. The Allies were simply caught off guard by the Japanese ability to move very quickly and to attack with great ferocity and great rapidity. The Japanese bonsai charge was used to the best effect, really, in those early campaigns. You know, in Malaya, I think in the Philippines, it's the quickness with which the Japanese onslaught fell upon the unprepared allies tended to sap their morale. And so the psychological environment allowed for the construction of this myth of the Japanese super warrior, which really wasn't dispelled until the campaigns of 1942 and 43. The Commonwealth units which stood between the Japanese advance and the prize of Singapore were forced into a rapid retreat. A key tactic which aided the Japanese advance was known to the Allies as the Scorpion Maneuver. Facing this tactic, 
the Allied troops began to learn how difficult it was to protect their flanks in the jungle. The Japanese force would break down into two components. Both components of the force would then advance on the enemy. As soon as one met the enemy, it would attempt to pin the enemy force. And the other part of the scorpion would then advance and attempt to attack the enemy from the flank or rear. The whole thing was like a scorpion, because essentially, the scorpion was grabbing you with its claws and then a swift strike with the tail, round the back, over the top, from the side. It was often very successful. Fast movement was also facilitated by the use of bicycles, which meant compromised roads wouldn't hold up in advance. They exploited bicycles brilliantly. Every unit had its own bicycle repairman accompanying the um, bicycle units so that if anybody got a puncture, they can sort it out in 10 minutes. A few key battles inflicted a toll on the attacking troops. The Australian troops at Gamas struck a blow on the 14th of January, costing Japan a few hundred casualties in a well-executed ambush. But the freight train that was the Japanese advance could not be stopped in Malaya. When the Japanese advance reached Singapore, the Commonwealth forces were caught off guard. Their fleet was occupied with the war in Europe, and the attack had come via Malaya. Their defenses were facing the wrong way. Singapore イギリスはアジアから、で、but the defenders had a 48-kilometer-long stretch of coast to defend, and no way of knowing exactly where an attack might occur. One must always remember that. There were more British and Australian troops in Malaya and later Singapore than there were Japanese. But the Japanese simply outfought them at every turn. And, of course, Japanese commanders outcommanded them. The Japanese soldier was better motivated, better trained, better prepared than his British and Australian counterpart. The British were still seeing everything in terms of roads, and so they were defending roads. The Japanese brilliantly exploited outflanking movements again and again. They found the British had established a blocking position on a road, and they just went round the back through the jungle. And the moment the British found themselves outflanked, they retreated. And you can't do this with the Japanese. They were up superb jungle soldiers. When the Japanese launched their attack on the Johor Strait, six Australian battalions stood in their way. It was not enough. The Australians had to fall back. There was a collective collapse in the morale and the confidence of British forces. It was really all over when the Japanese invasion force captured the city's water supply. At that point, it would have been very easy to lay the British forces under siege. And so Percival recognized that the situation was hopeless and uh, decided to surrender in order to preserve the lives of his men. The surrender took place in the Ford Motor Factory. Lieutenant General Arthur Percival signed the document, sealing the fate of more than 100,000 troops who became prisoners. Japanese commander, Lieutenant General Yamashita, had estimated it would take 100 days to have Singapore in his grasp. It took 70. 
The British defeat in Malaya and Singapore was a huge psychological blow. Part of the reason was that the public in Britain and elsewhere had been led to believe that Southeast Asia was well defended. And to this day, it remains Britain's worst defeat. Churchill was unbelievably distressed. He knew, and Alan Brooke, his chief of staff, knew too, that unless the British Army could fight better, not only would Britain not win the war, but the Americans, whose support was vital, were not going to believe that the British were capable of doing their part as allies. While the loss of Singapore was clearly a shock to British morale, it did serve to illustrate the seriousness of the fight. And the Allies responded accordingly. However, we shouldn't run away with the idea that Singapore and Malaya were a major body blow. One of the reasons for this was that Pearl Harbor and the invasion of Malaya brought the United States into the war. So a loss was balanced by a more serious gain. Another factor was that the Allies thought that the Japanese were not really a serious modern force. Once the Allies had got over the shock of what had happened in the first year of the war with Japan, everything was taken much more seriously. Equipment was improved, tactics were improved, and the myth of the Japanese Superman dissolved again almost as quickly as it had arisen. As Singapore fell, Allied forces were fighting an equally grueling campaign in the defense of Burma. When the Japanese invaded Burma in 1941, it was part of the British Empire and defended by two British divisions in Burma Corps. They were under strength, very poorly equipped and very poorly trained. The two Japanese divisions invading Burma, they were subsequently reinforced by two more, pushed the British back to the Indian frontier. And they also saw off a Chinese expeditionary force in the north of Burma. In February 1942, retreating Allied troops were stranded when a division commander blew the Sitang Bridge, a controversial move. Rangoon was lost on the 8th of March, less than a month after Singapore fell. Throughout the campaign, Allied aircraft harassed the Japanese invaders. But mounting losses meant Burma-based squadrons were withdrawn. The subsequent retreat from Burma was brutal. The British retreat was agonizing. It was carried out over hundreds of miles of largely difficult terrain in often terrible weather on roads clogged with hordes of refugees. And most of the equipment had to be left behind. So at the end of 1942, the Japanese are occupying most of Burma. And it was actually the longest retreat in the history uh, of the British Army. And it was said to be the Road of Bones. By mid-1942, Japan had secured a strong foothold to the north of Australia. They sought to cut off Allied supply lines, as it was clear the nation was becoming a major base of operations. Burma, Timor, the Netherlands East Indies, Java, much of New Guinea, the Philippines, and the Solomon Islands were all under Japanese occupation. Thailand was under Japanese influence. With Britain and the United States unable to offer the support the Thai government sought, Thailand had little choice but to cooperate with Japan. The Bangkok government declared war on the United States and the United Kingdom in January 1942. The sweep of Japanese victory and occupation across the Pacific meant that more than 100,000 men and women became prisoners of war. They were scattered in as many as 600 different camps throughout Japanese-occupied territories. Some were sent to Japan, 
The treacherous sea journey on hell ships, as they became known, cost many prisoners their lives. Conditions varied depending on the camp, but for the most part, they were terrible, and survival required heroic levels of determination and resilience. For American prisoners and Commonwealth prisoners, the constant struggle is to survive amidst hostile and different care and treatment really brutal treatment on the part of some of these guards. Although there are some, some recollections of humane treatment from guards. And indeed, sometimes it can be the same person, one day being brutal, the next day being humane. Illness was rampant in jungle camps, like those on the infamous Burma Thailand Railway. Between 1942 and 1943, tens of thousands of allied prisoners of war and more than 200,000 Asian civilians were forced to labor on its construction. Around half would perish before its completion. A starvation diet did little to help the men carrying out hard physical labor. Primary concerns are nutrition-associated disorders. The diet that Western prisoners received was scant consisting largely of rice, maybe some, some fish heads or some rotten vegetables. Never enough. While at the same time, prisoners are often compelled to work on you know, extremely strenuous construction projects. Prisoners also struggled with the diseases in the camps where they were. I mean, if they were, for example, held in Burma or in Malaya, they would be exposed to the clouds of mosquitoes, transmitting malaria and other diseases, and suffering and dying for it. The majority of them taken didn't survive. While the prisoners endured captivity, the fight for victory carried on. A key turning point in 1942 came not in the jungle, but on the sea. The battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. The first naval action that saw aircraft carriers fighting one another. The Battle of the Coral Sea resulted in the stalemate between the two forces. This was the Japanese attempt to take Port Moresby, which was the Australian-held seaport in southeastern New Guinea. If the Japanese had, had managed to take Moresby and the airfields around it, they would have been able to project their air power directly down into Queensland. They would have had air command of the sea lanes linking North America and Australia, forcing the Allies to reroute their shipping south of New Zealand. That would have been a significant setback. Both sides endured substantial losses to their fleets. Coral Sea, it's said, is a tactical victory for the Japanese. They did sink the aircraft carrier Lexington at a time when there were not many aircraft carriers to go around, so that was a significant blow. But the campaign was turned back, so in that sense, it was a strategic victory for the Allies. Allied successes would continue. In the Battle of Midway, close to 30 US ships, 19 submarines, and more than 100 planes launched from Midway and Hawaii. They faced the Japanese invasion fleet, which numbered close to 80 ships, including 44 destroyers and 15 submarines. So, the American Midway, 100% This was a period in the war when forces were roughly in balance. At the Battle of Midway, the Japanese had four aircraft carriers, uh, the Americans had three. Of course, the real difference maker was that the Americans had broken the Japanese naval codes 
and had essentially full knowledge of the Japanese plan, so they were able to set up an ambush. The battle began on the 3rd of June. By mid-morning, U.S. carrier-based aircraft had struck decisive blows, sinking four Japanese carriers. The the Japanese lost four of their first line aircraft carriers. And given the size of the Japanese economy, they were not able to replace those losses. They were never able to rebuild their aircraft carrier striking force to the kind of strength that it had in those early months of the war. And that had a significant impact on, on the rest of the war. The U.S. did not escape unscathed. The carrier Yorktown was crippled by a torpedo, as was a destroyer. But the Japanese invasion fleet withdrew. On land, Japanese fortunes continued to sour. The Kokoda Trek campaign proved to be an important turning point for the Allies, a turning point which proved the Japanese could be stopped. The stakes were high. The Japanese target, Port Moresby, was of strategic value to both sides. Initially, the Japanese wanted to take Port Moresby by sea in an impressive amphibious landing. However, the Japanese defeat at Coral Sea and then later on at Midway meant the Japanese weren't able to do this. And instead, they decided to land a small force on the northeast tip of Papua with a view of attempting to move inland across the impressive Owen Stanley Range towards Port Moresby, along a foot track which we now know as the Kokoda Track. The campaign to stop them, fought along the Kokoda Track, became one of the most iconic battles in Australian history. On the 21st of July, 1942, Japanese troops landed on Basabua Point in Papua and advanced rapidly towards Kokoda. The environment alone posed an extreme physical challenge. The Kokoda Trail crosses some of the most treacherous terrain that troops fought on in the Second World War. Essentially, you have 10 days worth of travel over a series of mountains. It sends and descends 5,000 meters, which when you look at it is more than that you would actually climb from the Everest base camp to the Everest summit. And then you consider that they're doing that in heat while they're being afflicted by leeches, mosquitoes, they're raven with dysentery. That's a lot to contend with, let alone thinking about the fact that you're also fighting a war and being shot at. Movement on the Kokoda track was slow. A distance which in open terrain might take hours, instead took days. Men became separated from their units the challenging nature of the terrain creating significant variations in the pace of each soldier. Their packs, some weighing as much as 50 kilograms, further slowed the advance. It's very hard to appreciate how claustrophobic jungle warfare is. It's hot, it's wet, people don't know where you are. For most of the soldiers on both sides, this is the first time they've ever been in this type of an environment. They're fighting along a very narrow front. So terrain is key. The terrain created significant problems for the use of artillery. Guns weighing hundreds of kilograms were almost impossible to drag through the mountainous jungle landscape. And so the Australians' use of artillery was limited. But the Japanese guns were far easier to disassemble, and they made great use of them in the early stages of the campaign not only had an effect on really demoralizing the Australians, the fact they were constantly under artillery bombardment without any course to retaliate, 
It also had a real appreciable impact on casualties with the Australians. It ended up killing more than 50% of the Australian fatalities up there. So that was definite advantage that the Japanese had that the Australians had nothing to counter with. Standing between Port Moresby and the Japanese advance were soldiers of the Papuan Infantry Battalion and the men of the 39th Australian Infantry Battalion. The defenders reached Kokoda on the 15th of July. Their first encounter with the advancing Japanese troops was at Awala on the 23rd of July. The defending troops were forced back to Kokoda, which fell on the 29th of July. They retreated to Daniki and then Isurava. Exhausted, they regrouped and prepared defensive positions. Tactically, look at the campaign as two distinct phases. First half of the campaign is the Japanese advance, where they're pushing the Australians, constantly harassing them every day, all the way back to Imeda Ridge. During that part of the campaign, the Australians are really trying to think, we just need to buy ourselves time. So they conduct what's called a fighting withdrawal. Fighting withdrawal is distinct from a retreat. In a fighting withdrawal, you're deliberately maintaining contact with the enemy because you want to slow down their advance as long as you can. And the Australians did that really successfully in the early part of September. The Australians' brutal fighting withdrawal continued through September to Minari and Iori Baiwa. Finally, the fighting withdrawal ceased at Imata Ridge. The Japanese troops could see the lights of Port Moresby from their positions, their goal tantalizingly close. But their supply and communication lines were stretched. They had such a short time frame that they'd given themselves to accomplishing the capture of Port Moresby. They didn't really think too far beyond that. At the end of the day, that's what really sunk the Japanese efforts in capturing Port Moresby. The Japanese exhausted their supply train, started to starve, and then really realized, well, everything else is going badly for us. We need to delay the attack on Port Moresby. Jungle fighting makes supply difficult. It was a challenge confronted by both sides in the Kokoda campaign. Vehicles and roads could not be relied upon as the primary method of supply. Equipment often had to be lugged by the troops themselves, adding to their exhaustion. Local civilians were employed and sometimes compelled to support these efforts. The campaign would in turn wreak havoc on their lives. Both sides wrecked huts and raided crops. Many locals fled their villages, seeking shelter from the fighting. Aircraft bombed and strafed villages. Dead lay out in the open. The war had made their homes a battlefield. The Japanese began withdrawing on the 24th of September, 1942 from Iori Baiwa. The decision to retreat was influenced by the successes of the Allies in another fight on Guadalcanal. I think in many ways too, what people don't really appreciate is just how key the fighting in Guadalcanal was to the outcome of the fighting in Kokoda. This overly ambitious push across the mountains in New Guinea towards Port Moresby, not as important as protecting Guadalcanal and the airfields in Guadalcanal. From the Japanese point of view, Guadalcanal was key. The Japanese withdrawal back across the Yoan Stanley range led to fighting as brutal as it had been in the early stages of the campaign. Intense fighting occurred at Templeton's Crossing at Eora Creek in October. On the 3rd of November, the Australian 7th Division Commander, Major General George Vasey, raised the Australian flag over Kokoda. This was not only a powerful morale boost for the men fighting on the track. Retaking Kokoda opened the local airstrip. Supplies could be delivered and casualties evacuated by air. Wounded men who would have previously endured 10 days of being carried to safety now only endured a half hour flight. The last major stand by the Japanese on the track was in brutal fighting around OEV and Garari. But it was not the end of the fighting on Papua. 
the Japanese withdrew to the beachheads, and the fighting at Buna, Gona, and San Amanda was a different kind of jungle fighting. Here, the Australian and Papuan troops were joined by Americans in a siege against entrenched Japanese positions. In the battle for the beachheads, the Royal Australian Air Force came into its own. Airstrips were carved out of the jungle in Dobodura, Hopendetta, and Wanagela. RAF planes performed the vital tasks of bombing and strafing Japanese forces, conducted reconnaissance missions, and provided crucial supplies to the Allied forces as they pressed on the Japanese positions. The fighting on Kokoda and the beachheads taught the Allies valuable lessons about jungle warfare. In many ways, it's a fight in Kokoda where the Australian Army really learns how to fight and operate in the jungle with confidence. Much of the pre-war training didn't really look at operating in the jungle. The Australian forces were involved fighting against the Japanese in the jungles of Malaya. However, most of that experience was lost once those men then became prisoners of war. The victory on the Kokoda track gave the Allies a significant morale boost. It was perceived as securing Australia and for that reason was significant morale victory. And it was the first time in which any uh, Japanese attempt to land forces on islands in the Pacific and to take territory had been turned back. And so that was an important uh, new precedent five months into the war. Throughout the Kokoda and Beachhead campaigns, one of the greatest threats was not enemy action, but illness and disease. Illness ravaged units and challenged medical personnel who confronted tropical diseases they had not encountered in peacetime practice. The treatment of dysentery within the Allied services had improved since World War I. The advent of the wonder drug sulfaguinidine provided a highly effective solution. This was in contrast to the Japanese units, which were plagued with the disease. Malaria posed a seemingly insurmountable problem. Both sides suffered terribly as the mosquito-borne disease spread itself across the battlefields of the Pacific War. One thing that Colonel Suji, the Japanese commander of the training station, really stressed was the problem of mosquitoes. The way he put it was that it was a dishonor to put yourself out of battle through the cause of a mosquito when there was still an enemy to fight. そういったことにほとんど準備をしないでマレーおよびビルマおよびニューギニアインドネシアに入ってったんです。ですから死亡率死亡で戦闘における死亡っていうのはだいたい二割ぐらい二十パーセントぐらいなんですが、その 80%の他の80%というのは病気や飢餓でだいたい亡くなってるんですね。それはそういった日本陸軍の中ではその南方で戦うということを全く想定してなかったという理由があります。The statistics tell a startling story. In 1942, over a six-month period in New Guinea. Australian forces reported in excess of 20,000 cases of malaria. Their battle casualties in that period totaled just 6,000. The symptoms are debilitating, sometimes life-threatening. Constant chills and shakes, almost like, you know, spikes in the body temperature, upwards of 104 degrees, exhaustion, loss of appetite, loss of energy, night sweats, and these symptoms would, unfortunately, spike, then they would withdraw, and then at any point in time, they could return. And this could go on for years. Among the malaria-ridden battlefields of the Pacific War was Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands, a battlefield which would prove to be one of the most significant of the entire Pacific campaign. Guadalcanal was the first true Japanese disaster of the war. If the Japanese had really been paying attention, if their commanders had really been thinking strategically, 
they would have garrisoned Guadalcanal effectively before the Americans got there. The lessons learned in the campaigns of 1941 and 1942 in Malaya, Burma, and New Guinea would prove to be invaluable to the Allies in the rapidly expanding Pacific War. And with the United States now fully committed to the war, Japan's dominion over the Asia-Pacific region, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere would be tested. <laughs>